Today's lesson is entitled Enlightenment One, Absolutism and Constitutionalism in Europe. What we're doing today is looking at the conditions which set up the Age of Enlightenment in the 18th century. In response to the religious instability of the 16th and early 17th centuries, many European kingdoms began rethinking the role of the monarch in daily politics. The late Middle Ages and the Renaissance had both seen an increase in royal power, which was accompanied by a decrease in the church's power. During this time, there were religious and scientific challenges to political power, but both could be harnessed successfully by secular rulers so as to increase their authority. And it's that story that we're going to look at in today's lesson. But first, let's go ahead and begin with a review of the Protestant Reformation. I want to do this to make sure that we're all on the same page chronologically and that everybody really understood the text that you were reading about the Protestant Reformation. Now, since 1054, Europe had been split religiously between two Christian churches, the Roman Catholic Church in the West and the Greek Orthodox Church in the East. When the Byzantine Empire was conquered by the Ottoman Empire in 1453, the power, political power, of the Greek Orthodox Church shifted northward into what is today Russia. But Europe retained that binary Christian system. You have Catholics in the West and the Orthodox in the East. Well, all of that changes, of course, with the coming of the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. Now, while Martin Luther was not the first monk to attempt a reform of the Catholic Church, he was obviously the first whose movement would fracture the unity of the West's Christianity. Luther's protest of some Roman Catholic practices centered around the sale of indulgences, the authority of the Pope, and a few other scattered elements. He wrote all of these down, codified them, in a document called the 95 Theses, which really set up a debate as to whether or not reform should be done in the church, and if so, what direction that reform should go. Now, Luther probably never intended to create a splinter group from the Catholic Church, but that's what happened, because the Pope and other high-ranking church officials were not able to debate and discuss in the way that Luther wanted. And so his initial concerns with the church developed into more broad concerns, which included not just questions about the political authority of the church, but also the belief system of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the new denomination that Luther established is what we today call Lutheranism. Luther's reform inspired quite a few others to look at reforming the church themselves. Of these, the most famous is undoubtedly John Calvin. And we've got two spellings of his name there because John Calvin was French. So this version, Jean, was actually the correct version of his name. Now, John Calvin, like Luther, came to question several of the elements of the Roman Catholic Church, but he disagreed with Luther on how to reform some of those elements. And for that reason, Calvin established his own new Protestant denomination, which he sets forth in the Institutes of the Christian Religion. Uh, we call Calvin's reform Calvinism, but he was greatly influential in the establishment of a more recognizable denomination to us, Presbyterianism, which was the Calvinist Church of Scotland specifically. Now, pretty much inevitably, as we saw in the Crusades, Protestant reformers and Catholics alike come to be convinced of their own religious rightness, righteousness, and they're absolutely willing to fight to promote their own idea of religious truth. Well, what that means is that we're going to get wars across Europe as Protestants and Catholics fight for their beliefs or the correctness of their beliefs. So as the Protestant Reformation spreads, it's going to spawn multiple battles and in a couple of cases just all-out war. In England, for example, right there, King Henry VIII decides that he is going to convert to Protestantism and he converts England as well. And he does this not because he genuinely feels that Protestant beliefs are better than Catholic beliefs, but for political reasons, for dynastic reasons. He wants to divorce his wife and the Catholic Church does not allow divorce, at least not the way that he was seeking it. Within the Holy Roman Empire, we have multiple fights 
primarily as Lutheran nobles see that they have an opportunity to break away from the Holy Roman Empire. And so they go to war against their Catholic emperor. And in France, we also see fighting. When Protestant nobles, who are Calvinist, see their chance to try and take the throne away from a series of kings who were very young and very Catholic in the early and then middle part of the 17th century. Now, the savviest monarchs are going to use religion, whether it was Lutheran or Calvinist or Anglican or Catholic, to strengthen their reigns and to expand their empires through missionary efforts. They're going to adhere to the advice of their religious leaders, but only when it suits them. And they're going to seek to codify their rule with absolute authority over their people. And that's really where the story of the Enlightenment begins. The political philosophy of absolutism, then, was born from this period of religious and political instability. While absolutist rulers have been seen in earlier human history, we saw them in the Middle East, we saw them in Egypt, European monarchs had never really had true absolute power over their kingdoms. European absolutists claim that they have the power of life and death over their subjects largely through the concept of divine right, monarchy, this belief that they ruled because God commanded them and their families to rule. And because it was God's will, they were able to rule as they wished, with absolute authority over their people. If we look at England, we see a really good example of early absolutism at play. Now, England in the Renaissance and throughout the early Reformation period was a place of amazing culture and discovery. Much of this was under the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, probably the most famous of the British monarchs. Over the course of her reign, England gloried in a renaissance. You guys undoubtedly know or recognize that Shakespeare did much of his work during Elizabeth's reign, and we have here an image of the Globe Theatre. She also funded explorations so that England's colonies could grow um, and hopefully come to challenge those of Spain or Portugal. Perhaps notably, she fought the Spanish when the Spanish attempted to invade England in 1588. And more thanks to cooperative weather than anything else, England defeated the great Spanish Armada and Elizabeth's rule was solidified by that fact, by that victory. But perhaps also very famously, Elizabeth chose not to marry. And she probably did so because she wanted to maintain political power in her own hands. This was a very savvy way of doing so. But what it meant is that when she died, she had no direct heir to inherit the throne. So upon her death in 1603, her dynasty, the Tudor dynasty, ended. And her second cousin became the new king of England, establishing a new dynasty in England. This new dynasty is the Stuart dynasty. When James became the king of England, he had already been ruling as the king of Scotland for several decades. So he came to England with a definite philosophy of how he was supposed to rule this new kingdom. He learned through Scottish experience that the way that you really rule effectively is with an iron fist. In Scotland, the advisory body to the king, the parliament, was pretty weak, and James was really able to steamroll over them and their objections and do whatever he wanted to in Scotland, and he expected to be able to do the same thing in England. But that was not precisely the case. So both James and his son and heir, Charles I, experienced tension with the English parliament because they wanted to do things their way, and the English Parliament felt that they deserved a bigger say in the running of the kingdom. Now, initially in England, as in Scotland, Parliament had really just been an advisory body for the king. But in 1215, so back in the, in the Middle Ages, the nobles had gotten together and they had forced their king, at the time it was King John, to sign a document, which we call the Magna Carta, or the Great Charter. This document really establishes Parliament as something more than just an advisory body. It's more of a regulatory body. For some actions, such as the raising of taxes, English kings were required to summon a parliament and to ask their permission to do so. That means that 
the members of parliament, the, the MPs, really felt like they had some say or deserved to have some say in the running of the government. This continues to be the case when you get the split of parliament into two houses. So parliament becomes bicameral, much like the current American legislature is. You had the House of Lords, where nobles sat and advised and helped to regulate. And you had the House of Commons, where commoners, and at this point in time, all commoner means is somebody who is not going to inherit a noble title, where the commoners sat and advised and regulated. Now, the problem was that it was the king's job to call a parliament together. And of course, the king only caused, called parliament together when he wanted something like to raise taxes. But the parliament felt that they could force the king to concede powers, regulations, to, to, to have him pass certain legislation if they just withheld the vote on economic issues. That wasn't necessarily always the case. And in fact, twice... King Charles I called Parliament, got a vote on taxes, agreed to some concessions, and then dissolved Parliament and pretty much did whatever he wanted to, not abiding by these concessions. By the time we get to the 1640s, Parliament has had enough. And it's that tension between King and Parliament about the English Civil War, which is fought throughout the 1640s. The English Civil War is fought between forces loyal to Charles who were called the Royalists, and forces loyal to Parliament, who were called the Parliamentarians. Now, each side had a nickname which was supposed to be derogatory. The Cavaliers, the Royalists, and the Roundheads, the Parliamentarians. For the Royalists, their nickname of Cavalier was meant to be derogatory because it associated them with the French. And of course, nobody wanted to be associated with the French. So it called attention to the fact that the Cavaliers wore their hair long and flowing and curly like the French did, that they wore really fancy dress like the French did, um, and that they kind of flaunted their wealth in various ways. On the other hand, that nickname, the Roundheads, was also supposed to be negative. It called attention to the fact that the parliamentarians tended to wear this sort of round bowl cut, looks a lot like what little boys tend to wear when they're about three, four years old, um, and that their method of dress was very stark and not very pretty, right? So they had these round haircuts and they didn't dress quite as nice as the uh, cavaliers did. You can also see the indications of their wealth by the words that are used on this particular political cartoon, right? The cavaliers have their poodle, a really fancy dog. That's probably a King Charles Spaniel. And uh, the roundheads have a mongrel, a cur, right? Something that they picked up off the streets. Well, you might think that since the royalists were made up of nobles, and since the nobles probably had a lot more military training, that they would win the English Civil War. But that's not, in fact, what happened. Rather, the parliamentarians won, largely because of the work of Oliver Cromwell, who became the leader of the parliamentarian party. When Charles was defeated, he was captured by the parliamentarians, and they didn't quite know what to do with him. And finally, it was decided that they were going to put him on trial for treason against the English people because he was an absolutist. So he was put on trial. He was found guilty of treason. And the penalty for treason at that time was death. So Charles I was executed by the English state. So it was really the first time that a monarch had been executed by their subjects. This is known as regicide. And it was a huge deal across Europe. It caused a couple of problems. The first problem was that on the continent, you had kingdoms that chose not to do any business with England. So England found themselves cut off because they had killed their king. Well, the second thing that happened was you have a power vacuum, right? Charles's family, his wife and his sons, they flee to France uh, because his wife is French and they don't have anywhere else to go. And there's no one left to rule. So Oliver Cromwell steps into that void and he establishes a government which is known as the English Commonwealth or the English Protectorate. England becomes, in essence, a military dictatorship. But there was more. Cromwell and a lot of the members of the Parliamentarian Party were Calvinist. Now, in England at this time, Calvinist Christians were known as Puritans because they were fundamentalists. They were seen as very extreme and puritanical in their Christian views. Well, when Cromwell became the de facto leader of the English government, he very deliberately infused his religious beliefs 
into that government. And for that reason, the Commonwealth is also often called the Puritan Republic. And this is the government that England will have throughout much of the 1650s. Now, ironically, despite never taking the title of king, Cromwell still seeks to rule with absolute power. So the English really had merely exchanged one absolutist for another. They hadn't actually done anything about their government. Well, at Cromwell's death, Parliament stepped in to the political void. They wanted to avoid another Cromwell coming to power. And they instead asked for Charles I's oldest son, whose name was also Charles, to return to England and to restore the English monarchy. Well, Charles agrees to do so. And he returns to England with great pomp and circumstance, and everyone is super happy because they think, finally, we're getting rid of this absolutist stuff. We asked the king to come back, and because we asked him, he knows that really we're the ones in charge. Except that's not precisely the way that Charles understood it. Yes, he returns to England. He's more than happy to rule over England. But he's an absolutist, just like his father was. And he has very definite views on how he is supposed to rule. So he calls Parliament as an advisory body, but ignores them when he wants to. And this only frustrates Parliament more and more. They're also frustrated by the fact that Charles, who is married, doesn't have any legitimate heirs. Uh, he has a ton of illegitimate children, but by dint of their being illegitimate, they cannot hope to inherit the English throne. So Charles's heir apparent is his younger brother, James. Now that's all well and good, except for one thing. James, Parliament suspects, is Catholic. Turns out that they were right. And they definitely do not want a Catholic to sit on the throne of England again. England has its own Protestant church, the Church of England, and the leader of the English nation is supposed to be the supreme head of the Church of England. You can't have a Catholic sitting as the head of a Protestant church. So Parliament is very nervous about this possibility of James becoming king. And then when Charles dies in 1685, and in fact, James becomes king, they're even more worried because James gets married and his wife gets pregnant. And they worry, well, what if the baby is a boy? If it's a boy, that boy now becomes the heir to the throne ahead of James's daughters, who are both Protestant. Well, this potentially creates a new Catholic dynasty for England. So the problems just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. What's a parliament to do? Well, they'd done it once before. They'd reached out to Charles II and asked him to come to England. They decide, what do we have to lose? Let's reach out to somebody else and ask them to come and depose James II, get rid of James II. The person that they reach out to is Mary Stuart. She's pictured right here. Mary Stuart was James's eldest daughter, and she had been married as a very young woman to William III, who was the Prince of Orange. Uh, he was Dutch. She had been raised as a Protestant and remained a Protestant. Her husband was a Protestant. So Parliament reached out to them and asked them to come in and take control of the British throne. When James found out about this, he fled from England, and he did try to fight um, but there was really only one battle, and it didn't even take place in England. It took place in Ireland. So really, Mary and William were able to come in and fairly painlessly, in fact, the nickname is bloodlessly, were able to establish themselves as the potential monarchs of England. This event is known as the Glorious Revolution. Now, Parliament has learned its lesson. They're not just going to crown William and Mary king and queen and assume that William and Mary, just because they promise, are going to allow Parliament a say in government. So instead, what Parliament does is that they draft a document, which is called the Bill of Rights. This document establishes rules which determine the eligibility of potential monarchs and which places limits on the powers of the monarch. This is a political philosophy that is known as constitutionalism. In England, since they retained a monarchy, it is and uh, was referred to as a constitutional monarchy. So William and Mary duly agree to abide by the terms of the Bill of Rights, and so Parliament allows them to be crowned King and Queen of England. What that means is that as England heads into the 18th century, 
This is a country that had already faced the challenge of absolutism and had already found it lacking. So they had challenged it and established a new form of government, one, it turns out, that would be more politically stable than absolutism had been. And what's important is that that stability will allow England to focus more directly on its growing empire. So when we look at one of the reasons why England establishes this huge and very profitable empire in the 18th century, much of it has to do with the political stability that was brought on by the constitutional monarchy of England. The rest of Europe, however, would still be looking at and fostering absolutism during the 17th and even into the 18th centuries. So Europe will go through the same sort of challenge to absolutism that England did. They're just going to do it a century, a century and a half after England did. A good example of this situation is France. In France, you have the reign of Louis XIV, who is known as the Sun King. Louis inherits the throne upon his father's death in 1643. Slight problem. Louis is all of five years old at the time that he becomes the king of France, and his extreme youth makes him a target. Much of his childhood was spent moving around from palace to palace as he tried to avoid kidnapping, assassination attempts, etc., because his extreme youth meant that French nobles were trying to capture him or kill him so that they could earn the throne and they could get political power in France. Louis was deeply, deeply affected by all of these revolts and assassination attempts and attempted kidnappings, such that from a very young age, he determined that when he was an adult and when he had the power to rule, he was going to make sure that nobody told him what to do, that he told other people what to do, and that he had absolute control over his kingdom. This ensures, of course, that everything about France revolves around him which we see another reason for the nickname the Sun King, right? Heliocentrism uh, for the scientific revolution. As an example of his great authority, Louis decides to move the royal palace from Paris, where the royal family had lived and from which they had ruled for about 700 years, to the town of Versailles, which is just outside of Paris. He forces the nobles to move with him if they want to have anything to do with him. And this is a big concern. What Louis was trying to do is make sure that the nobles had to move away from their seats of power and play on his home court. And so he built an entire palace to allow for this to happen. And when we look at Versailles today, and here's an image of the outside of Versailles, it's incredibly impressive. It's huge. But even as big as it was, it could not house all the nobles of France comfortably. Well, Louis knew this. He knew that they were going to have to sacrifice their comfort in order to see him hope to speak to him face to face. So while Versailles is beautiful and lavish and really gorgeous inside and out, it's a symbol of Louis's wealth. His apartments were gorgeous. Those of his family were gorgeous and spacious. But the nobles had to live in these tiny cramped quarters and they had to exist for the hope of speaking with Louis just, just for a few minutes, every day, every week, every month. Incidentally, one of the nobles who enjoyed Louis XIV's hospitality at Versailles was his cousin, uh, the former King James II of England, who is going to exile himself to France and will live there until his death in the early 18th century. Now, once Louis had focused his nobles on the palace at Versailles, he played them off against one another, uh, effectively ensuring that they weren't really paying attention to what was going on in the rest of France, which allowed him to assert complete authority over domestic policy in France, foreign policy in Europe. He even was able to assert his control over the Catholic Church in France. Um, and then, of course, continue to expand his colonial empire pretty effectively. One of the reasons why Louis XIV was able to command such enormous political power and influence was because of his great wealth. And he owed the growth of his treasury to his finance minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert. Colbert developed a new economic theory, which is called mercantilism. The concept of mercantilism is actually pretty simple. Colbert believed that a country's prosperity depended on its tangible treasure, literally how much gold and silver it could get its hands on. 
Well, in order to increase France's treasure, it was necessary to ensure that more money came in via exports than went out via imports, right? When you're exporting products, then people are paying you for that stuff, so money's coming in. When you're importing projects, then you are paying someone else for stuff, so money's going out. Well, in order to foster this sort of high imports, low exports, the French government began to subsidize industries that promoted French exports or that were important to the export business, like shipbuilding or the wine industry. With mercantilism, then, the government had a much larger role over the economy, and it was constantly trying to maximize its profit and its wealth. That's one of the reasons why this time period, the middle, late 17th century and into the 18th century, is really the golden age of the colonial period. What we see is really intensive trade happening across the Atlantic, both in the North and in the South, and then also across the Indian Ocean. What's happening is what we refer to as triangular trade. Europe is undoubtedly conducting this sort of trade. And what they're doing is they're manufacturing goods from raw materials that they're getting from their colonies in the Americas. And then they're selling their manufactured goods back to colonies in Africa and in the Americas. In payment for these manufactured goods, the African people are using slaves. And these slaves are going to the Americas, of course, to continue helping to produce these raw materials. So mercantilism really depended on a nice colonial empire to help maintain an enormous and, and potentially vast wealth for the kingdom. So to recap, absolutist monarchs tended towards certain behaviors. They wanted absolute control of domestic and political policy. They had control over economic policy in their kingdoms. They also had absolute control over foreign policy decisions. And one of the ways in which they enforced this control was to use war, waging war, as policy. The idea was that rather than depending on diplomacy, which could be slow and it didn't yield great results necessarily, a strong monarch could force what they wanted by the use of, of the military and, and violence. Louis was able to use war for political gain because he was wealthier than earlier French monarchs had been, right? More money equals more soldiers equals more war for the glory of the kingdom and increased political influence both domestically and internationally for Louis and for France. Now, interestingly enough, as you guys can see on the map, it's not like he had enormous power and was able to gain a ton of land. In fact, he really was only able to gain very little. But in gaining what he did, he forced Europe to take notice of the fact that France was powerful, that France could expand, and that Louis and the French monarchs really had to be taken pretty seriously. Louis went to war four times between the years 1667 and 1713. European countries, because they feared France, formed alliances against him, and still Louis was able to add to French territories. But Louis dies, as we all must, in the year 1715. According to one biographer, Louis told his successor, who would end up being his great-grandson, quote, Soon you will be king of a great kingdom. Try to remain at peace with your neighbors. I loved war too much. Do not follow me in that or in overspending. Lighten your people's burdens as soon as possible and do what I have had the misfortune not to do myself. Now, why would Louis say that when mercantilism and waging wars had been so beneficial to him personally? The fact of the matter was, by 1715, Louis had pretty much blown through the entirety of his treasury. So he was leaving his great-grandson a kingdom that was essentially bankrupt. And so for France and for the French monarchs, much of the 18th century was going to be focused on how precisely do we pay off our debt? How do we increase the treasury? And in fact, when absolutism finally blows up in the face of the French monarchs, which happens at the end of the, of the 18th century, it's this economic issue 
that really has kept needling the people and has forced that challenge. Now, other European monarchs are going to use Louis XIV's reign as an example for their own governments. We see this, for example, in Russia. Unlike France, though, Russia is going to remain an absolutist monarchy until 1917, so an incredibly long-lived absolutist state. In 1613, which is just 10 years after Elizabeth I dies and during the reign of James I, a brand new dynasty comes to power in Russia. These are the Romanovs. The Romanovs get to enjoy the centralization and the territorial expansion of earlier czars. But the Romanov dynasty's first really great absolutist ruler won't come until the end of the 17th century in the person of Peter, who we call the Great. As a young man, Peter had traveled in Western Europe, primarily in Germany, and he'd been astonished by all of the innovation that he saw. He was greatly impressed by the philosophy, by the new understandings and discoveries of the scientific revolution, and he determines that he's going to return home to Russia and he's going to westernize Russia. And he needs to, because the only way that Russia will be able to compete effectively against the rest of Europe is if they westernize, if they're doing and adopting the same things that other Western European powers are doing. So he returns to Russia and he's determined to put in place some of these things that he's seen. He brings with him Western advisors so that they can help him with science and education and all sorts of other avenues. But for a political philosophy, he chooses absolutism, and really specifically, absolutism the way that Louis XIV was practicing absolutism in France. Well, once he becomes the czar, officially the, the singular czar, in 1696, he begins this task of westernizing Russia. And it's not easy. I mean, you can do a lot in terms of educating people or putting up new buildings that reflect a Western style, but trying to change culture is quite different. So in order to force the Russian nobility to adopt Western styles of dress and manners, Peter institutes taxes on nobles who choose to maintain a more traditional style. And eventually, they get priced out. If they want to keep paying taxes, they can keep dressing the way they had traditionally, but if they want to stop paying taxes and be taken seriously by Peter, they've got to adopt Western dress. Peter also introduces French as a language of the Russian court. And so Russian and French coexist for a while um, as the language of the Russian court. In fact, eventually Russian will be spoken less and less at the Russian court and French and other foreign languages will be spoken more and more. Now, Peter also understands that Part of the strength of an absolutist monarch is its is army, its military. So he beefs up the army and he creates a navy. Now, Russia had never had a navy, so he's starting from scratch here. The problem is that the Russian Empire didn't really have a whole lot of coastal territory. So as Louis had done, Peter has to go to war first to get some coastal territory so that he can begin establishing his navy. So he goes to war against Sweden and he gains coastal access from taking over territories uh, right there along the northern coastline. And then he establishes a secondary capital, St. Petersburg, right on this newly acquired land. St. Petersburg is made, it's a created city, made in the same view as Western cities. So he imports all sorts of architects and city planners who design a city based on Western ideals. When you go to St. Petersburg or you see images of St. Petersburg, these buildings look like they could be in Germany or in France. They don't look typically Russian. And in fact, if we look at this map right here, you see how very carefully the grids of the city were planned out. So this was literally a master planned community and it took advantage of the sea access so that the Russian Navy could access the Atlantic and wage war as they needed to. So what we see when we look at this initial response to political and religious instability is that the monarchs do everything they can to centralize power in their own hands. Now eventually that's going to crack, right? We saw that happen already in England. But that cracking is a story of the 18th century for the rest of Europe. And that's what we'll talk about in our next lesson, 
on the enlightenment.